Welcome to another CPD or Continuing Professional Development online podcast from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. My name is Raj Basord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London. Joining me today to talk about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder following uh, the publication of a recent review paper in the New England Journal of Medicine is Dr. Heidi Feldman from the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is the Ballinger Swindells Professor of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics and she co-published her recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine um, with Dr. Michael Reef, who's at the University of Minnesota. So, uh, Dr. Feldman, your fascinating paper begins with a comment on the fact that there appears to be a dramatic rise in the incidence of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, particularly in America, in recent years. But is that a real rise, or is that more an apparent rise because maybe the disorder is more effectively recognized recently? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to share information with uh, colleagues across the giant ocean. Um, I would think that the um, rise in prevalence has a lot to do with greater identification of children who have the disorder more than a true rise in the prevalence of the disorder. Um, I think we have much more awareness about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and how it can affect children in a variety of settings. We have greater access to professionals who are familiar with the disorder and able to make these diagnoses, so I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, there certainly is a lot of concern that there are aspects of modern life that make this condition more prevalent. They may be things like uh, deterioration in our diet, or they may be things like um, earlier and more screen time for young children. Um, my guess is that that's a small contributor and that this condition has been around for a long time and is now being recognized more effectively. So that's a very interesting idea that it's been around for a long time because it's kind of kind of seen as a very modern disorder, but you think it really has been around a long time back into the past? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, uh, the modern era demands of children that they spend more time attending, sitting still, learning. Um, so if you go back 50 or 100 years when many children didn't attend school or they didn't attend school for very long, uh, there may have been less of a functional impact of these characteristics in everyday life. Now that we expect of children to learn to read, to sit still, to do um, homework, um, it's easier to see that, uh, that there are some children who pay minimal attention to the world around them, that they don't have the ability to concentrate, and that their activity level is very, very high. But there are children's books back into the 1800s that describe Fidgety Phil, um, who knocks over all of the, the dinnerware uh, from the table um, and uh, probably would, in today's world, be diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You also mention in your fascinating paper the possibility that there could even be overdiagnosis. So let's just talk a bit about the diagnosis. Because speaking as a psychiatrist, it's one of those disorders that I find one of the most difficult to diagnose. You almost seem to have a kind of intuitive feel for it. So how would you advise colleagues to go about uh, making the diagnosis correctly? The tough thing about making the diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is that we don't have any biomarkers, we don't have any blood tests or imaging studies to help us along the way. And so we need to um, make an assessment about a child's behavior. And the other thing that's really challenging is that that behavior is not necessarily characteristic if we just look at it in the office setting. So we need informants in the child's real world to make the diagnosis. What we do in the United States is we get um, questionnaires from both teachers and parents. And these t questionnaires have been um, uh, standardized and their psychometric properties are decent. And so we can use the score on the questionnaires to give us a really good gauge. Now it turns out that in many situations the parents and the teachers agree and you can see 
high levels of inattention and high levels of overactivity or hyperactivity and then we feel rather confident that the child is affected with the condition. There are also situations where parents and teachers disagree or they um, they, they may just disagree in the sort of quantification of the symptoms or they may actually disagree altogether in whether or not the child demonstrates the symptoms. And then we have to really probe more deeply and see if there's characteristics of the setting that makes it more or less likely that one of the observers will, uh, you know, will see these characteristics and the other one won't. The other thing that we have to be sure of is that the symptoms are long-lasting, that they're cross-situational, and that they really affect the child's function. So there are children who seem to jump from thing to thing and are very quick, and yet they're learning, they're, um, they have good friendships, they assume responsibilities at home, and they carry out those responsibilities effectively. So there's no functional consequence of their behavioral profile. And ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, requires the symptom complex and the functional consequences. And if we look at that symptom complex, there's inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. So could you give us some examples of, of those three things that, that would alert you as a clinician that this is someone that could be suffering from ADHD, the inattention bit, the hyperactivity bit, and the impulsivity bit? Right. So inattention is often the uh, failure to concentrate, to stay on task for a long period of time, to be easily distracted by sometimes external stimuli, sometimes even internal stimuli like a child's other thoughts. And so what you might see is a child who sits down to do homework and is up and down and up and down all the time, noticing that the pencil needs to be resharpened, that there's a breeze coming in through the window, that the television is on, that the television is off, the television goes on, uh, and they just jump from, from um, item to item. They have trouble organizing to complete a task, so they might dive into a task without having all, all of the papers that they need or um, scissors and crayons or whatever it is depending upon their assignment. So that's the inattention. Hyperactivity is that they're really up and on the go. And so if you had uh, squares on the floor and you counted how many squares they crossed in a unit of time, it would be higher than the average child. Or they may stay within one of the squares, like on their seat, but they're fidgeting and throwing themselves back and forward. Sometimes they're making noises and humming. Um, and it's as if they have a little engine inside and that engine is going very quickly. And the impulsivity, which tends to course with hyperactivity, is that they don't think before acting. So they blurt out answers, they dash across the street, um, they're apt to get into accidents because they're um, acting in ways that might prove dangerous. Now, now with the inattention one, one of the bits that I find difficult about this is um, a, a child may appear to suffer from inattention at school, um, mm -hmm. But they may just be bored by school. In other words, a, a parent may describe a lot of inattention to me, but that kid can sit and watch a Batman movie quite happily for several hours. So how, how as a clinician do you deal with that issue? Um, well, watching a Batman movie um, without really checking how much the child has taken in and how well they've concentrated on that Batman movie turns out to be a very insensitive indicator about whether the child is truly paying attention. And I think the way to think about it is that children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are not necessarily inattentive under all circumstances, but under the usual circumstances with um, the average kinds of motivation, like you want to do well in school because that's what's expected of you by your family and even you yourself, under those circumstances of um, routine motivational uh, situations, the child can't mount the attention that's required. It doesn't mean that under uh, circumstances of, of intense motivation that the child never can um, show good attentional capacity. So there often is a difference between how they function during their chosen favorite activities and during the required activities of a school-aged child's life. <laughs> 
And what about the, the, the pattern over time? As a clinician, are you looking for a child who, from the word go, from the earliest memory of the parents, always had these problems, or can it have a certain onset at a certain age? So right. what's the sort of the temporal shape of the disorder? Thank you. That's a really good question. So usually parents can report um, something about children in their toddler or preschool years, which may not be full-blown attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but give you the feel that the child was heading in that direction. And then when the environmental demands go up, for example, at school age, the um, disorder fully manifests. Um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental and Emotional Disorders that we use here in the United States um, used to say that the symptoms should be present before age seven. Um, they've altered that in the latest version, the DSM-5, which came out in May uh, 2013, to say that the symptoms should be present before age 12. I actually think that in the vast, vast majority of cases, you'll find evidence of the symptoms much earlier than 12. If the symptoms seem to appear full-blown at 12 without any uh, little inklings beforehand, I would look for other diagnostic uh, categories before I would entertain attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I really like the symptoms to be present, sometimes as early as preschool, but definitely in early school age. They may not present with their full functional impact until later when the demands have gone up, but the, the general behavioral complex is there a bit earlier. So, I mean, this may not be a question that you'd be happy to answer, but um, just touching briefly, because I, I, this, this um, conversation isn't really about it, but about adult ADHD. So some adults come to you as an adult psychiatrist, and they claim to have had ADHD all their lives, just it wasn't diagnosed till they got to their 20s. Um, and there's a fair amount of suspicion in the uh -huh. UK psychiatric community that some of those people are just after certain drugs with that story. I mean, have you any thoughts about that, about the notion that you could have ADHD up until your 20s and never be diagnosed? Yeah, I, I again would look that maybe it wasn't diagnosed, but that the, there were telltale signs for quite a long time. So telltale signs might be that um, a child may get adequate grades, but get all sorts of comments by the teacher that you know it's it's a bit challenging to keep him on task, or he's up and about too much, or he's a class clown, or in, in other ways demonstrating that he's um, having difficulty curbing his um, uh, inattention or his hyperactivity. I, I am also suspicious that uh, this would de that this would present even in, in adolescents, let alone in adults, without any um, early indicators. Okay, let's talk a bit about treatment. You outline in, in your paper that they're drug treatments, but also you do mention behavioral treatments, and this often seems to get much less attention, maybe because it's very easy to prescribe a drug, but can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by these behavioral interventions that you've mentioned in the paper? Right, so I think that if you look to the studies that are in our uh, literature, drug treatment works for the symptoms of ADHD, that is it improves attentional capacity and it reduces hyperactivity and impulsivity, but it doesn't, but drug treatment doesn't necessarily improve the child's function. It doesn't necessarily improve grades, it doesn't improve um, standing on the standardized tests that children get at the end of school years or, or school epochs, and um, it doesn't necessarily make them good friends uh, with other children in the classroom. So behavioral treatments are designed to manipulate primarily motivation and to allow the child to go inside and find what she or he needs in order to um, be more attentive or less um, active or impulsive. So um, in home situations, parents can manipulate rewards and consequences, and um, over time, uh, especially if there's consistency, the child begins to anticipate and shift the motivational state so that they can find their best attentional capacity um, and pull it um, out when needed. In classrooms, it's pretty similar that the teachers, the adults in the room, begin by 
um, manipulating rewards and punishments and other consequences so the children get the same kind of practice of you know attending at the, t at the time of peak motivation and <clears throat> excuse me and it's also possible to use peers and uh, social relationships among children to to have the same kind of consequence so those are all behavioral strategies because they're manipulating the rewards and the negative consequences of behavior. We know that cognitive behavior therapy, the kind of therapy in which you use thinking skills to control your behavior, the kind of therapy that can be very helpful in depression and in anxiety, is less effective, especially in children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, and um, we think that's because the children um, don't have the skill set yet to use those thinking skills to control their own behavior. Um, whether or not cognitive behavior methods are more effective when you get to adolescents and adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, I think, has not been adequately studied. Could you just touch on the drug treatments? Because there's some very old drugs, but there's some now very new drugs around. and um, are, are there particular drugs that you favor or you recommend? And, and what are your thoughts about how a clinician uh, should go about making a decision about which drug to prescribe? Yeah. So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics in the U.S. here has um, promulgated practice guidelines first in 2001 and now in 2011, a, a reissuing of the practice guidelines. And I um, sat on that committee and I believe in what they say, the first line of treatment for attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder is stimulants. The second line is stimulants and the third line is stimulants. And the stimulants offer a lot of advantages. They are generally short acting. The long acting or extended release um, preparations are fancy manipulations of short acting medications. They work very quickly, so you can, um, you know, give a child a trial on Tuesday and have a, a gut sense about whether or not they're going to work for that child. You may have to manipulate doses or schedule, but you get an idea of the positive effects within the same day that you first give them. Um, there are um, some side effects, but they're actually pretty mild, and many of them can be um, reduced through uh, careful dosing or scheduling. So they're the, the mainstay of treatment for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And in head-to-head -head comparisons with other classes of drugs, they do better. Um, the other choices are the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, uh, atomoxetine, um, which is uh, of advantage because it once you get to a steady state, it's in the system 24 hours a day where the stimulants are basically short acting and there for 6, 8, or 12 hours depending upon how it's delivered. Um, so atomoxetine has a role, um, but it's not as effective in head-to-head -head comparisons with the stimulants. And the other um, class that's uh, been used are the alpha adrenergics, uh, um, clonidine and guanfacine, um, and they have um, some role as a primary um, medication. Uh, sometimes children who have ticks as a side effect of stimulants um, do better with the alpha adrenergics. Um, for both, uh, with both norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors and alpha adrenergics, sometimes adolescents. Uh, who, where there may be temptation to abuse or divert medications, sometimes they'll prescribe these other classes of medication. But when you can get away with stimulants, they are by far and away the easiest medication to use. Well, thank you very much for that. One final question. Um, this feels to me like a disorder where there seems to be a big gap between the ability of a specialist like yourself in terms of what you can offer compared to a generalist. And is there anything you might want to say about how to improve the training of, of general psychiatrists or family doctors even that could um, help improve the prognosis of this condition? Uh, in the United States we've um, decided in a sense, the professional organizations have decided that the 
prevalence of the condition is high enough that subspecialists like me or child psychiatrists or psychiatrists really wouldn't be able to meet the needs of the general population. And just as you suggested, uh, primary care physicians, which in this country may be family doctors or general pediatricians, um, really need to be part of the, uh, the professional group that is competent to diagnose and manage the condition. So what we've done in this country is to write these practice guidelines that I think have actually made quite a nice um, shift in the knowledge base and the willingness of primary care physicians to do primary diagnosis and also management. And then to refer to specialists when they get stuck, either because there's something unusual about the presentation or because the usual first line and second line medications don't seem or, or treatments don't seem to be um, doing what they should be doing. Um, and so I think these practice guidelines and then professional education around them um, is really helpful. We could probably do more using modern communication techniques like um, web-based education where we could show examples of children and we could help uh, cl clinicians to score standardized rating scales and in other ways get them prepared for the, the job of, um, of making the diagnosis. In the U.S. a lot of the primary care physicians say, well we just don't have the time for this, our visits are much shorter than the subspecialty visits and recognizing that that is absolutely true, the diagnosis doesn't have to be made in a single session. And I think there are advantages of taking two or three or four sessions, gathering information gradually, learning more about the child, the family, the, the environment and the setting, and making sure that there aren't other things that are mimicking attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, in that particular case that gives the primary care physician a leg up over the subspecialist. So um, I am very, very strong supporter that this can be done well um, with shared uh, responsibility when uh, there's something unusual about the case. So you sound very optimistic about the prognosis for this disorder if, it's, if, if the child attracts the correct treatment. So what is your view about the prognosis? Because some people can be quite negative about the prognosis of this yeah. disorder. Well, the, the prognosis of the disorder is it's a very interesting question. On the one hand, if you look at things like the academic achievement of uh, individuals with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's not as good as the that not as good as what you might suspect for that individual's social class and maybe even intelligence level. So a smaller percentage of um, individuals with ADHD complete high school and uh, there are fewer individuals than you might expect going to university and there are fewer of those people who start university who finish university and they have more relationship changes and they get into more car accidents or you know other kinds of accidents so those are negative features about the long-term prognosis at the same time, um, they're capable of relationships and getting positions and driving cars, so that's the upside. Um, I think that the prognosis um, is probably more connected to things like the child's overall intelligence, the level of social support, and the child's ability to fashion a life that uses their characteristics as strengths rather than as negative features that um, influence the prognosis. So as children get older into adolescence and young adulthood and they have ADHD, I think our professional perspective has to shift and we have to support them in being good community members, um, building good relationships, getting a good job and a job that's suitable for them, um, you know, exercising safety in the community and participating fully in activities that give them pleasure and let them, you know, dissipate any extra energy that persists into adulthood. Dr. Heidi Feldman, thank you very much indeed. Um, a module test is available with this podcast on the website of the Royal College of Psychiatrists for anyone listening who might want to obtain their CPD or Continuing Professional Development Certificate. The test will ask for an access code, the code word 
for this podcast is attention. Dr. Feldman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed.